Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, those willing to question what they think they know or what they might believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a great chat room, and I love your description of it, Ravinder, so please share it with everyone. We do. We have a fabulous chat room and a great group of people. Uh, it adds a whole dimension to the subject matter that you're discussing on the air. I always learn some more, and, you know, oftentimes you, we can't get questions on the air, So, but we discuss them in the chat room, and we provide each other with answers in there. So they always give me great insight. So if you can come join us, too, to do so, please. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. And very often, for the record, we do get the questions out of the chat room on the air. I try and prioritize those. So if you have a question, a chat room is a great place to go to put that question forward. In today's spotlight, I would like to discuss the notion of self, who I am and who I want to be. We all have a self-portrait of sorts. That is, we all know ourselves by some common measures, like our name, marital status, home, occupation, etc. And we also know ourselves in interior ways, such as our likes, dislikes, proclivities, attitudes, ambitions, secrets, and so forth. As such, our identity is who we have come to know ourselves as. Now imagine that you lost your senses altogether. Would that change who you know yourself to be? Probably not. So what if you suddenly became an acquired savant like Jason Pageant, who was on this show, and now the world was an illustration of fractal geometry? Would this still be you? The you you know? What if a head blow turned you into a, a synesthete? like Joel Salinas, Dr. Joel Salinas, who's also been on this show. And like him, you actually felt the pain of others. Would taking on another's pain change you enough that your self-identity would become foreign to your former self? Now, what if you lost all your memories, like Deborah Sanders, who also has appeared on this show? Suddenly, you wake from a horrible accident and know not who you are, where you are, or anything else about yourself. Clearly now your self-identity is different. Perhaps it is limited to your body, but that's not who you are, or is it? Aging teaches all of us that who we are is not self-image, as photographed when we're babies or small children or teenagers or young adults. No, this body thing is an ever-changing event. And I would suggest that so is your self-representation or identity. As Heraclitus once put it, you can never step into the same stream twice. We are all dynamic beings in constant flux, just as all of nature. We can change our personalities. They are malleable. Our attitudes frequently alter. Our likes and dislikes can vary from time to time. But most importantly so can our view of our role in the world. The world changes one person at a time. A friend of mine recently reminded me of a quote by George Bernard Shaw. Quote goes this way, We have no more right to consume happiness without producing it than to consume wealth without producing it. Think about that for a moment. How much happiness are you producing today And how could you increase it? Life isn't about your past. It's always about the present. What can you do in this moment to increase the happiness in your world? 
As you produce happiness, you gain happiness. Isn't that what we all want? And isn't that, in the end, what we always want to be? For me, it seems the rest is only in the details. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? You know, there's interesting, there's actually two aspects, I think, to what you've just covered. This, this idea of if you suddenly forgot who you are. You know, there have been s- several flicks done about that, uh, you know, where a mean bad guy, a business person, I think I'm, I'm thinking of the Harrison Ford movie, but there have been others like that where, you know, they have an accident and then they totally forget who they are and then they come out the other side a lot nicer and very different. Um, and as it r- relates to the work that you and I do within a talk as well, what would happen if you suddenly forgot all of your fears, all of those things that hold you back? I wonder what that would do as well to your outcome and what, what you could possibly achieve if you suddenly forgot your past pains and all of those insults and stuff that we lock away inside us. I think that's just really interesting to to contemplate Um, and then the other part of what you were talking about you know I think that is absolutely perfect invest in your happiness there are so many people that are out hunting for happiness as though it's something that they get this idea that happiness is something that you give and in that process of giving happiness you gain happiness as well I think that has to be a wonderful piece of advice to for everybody you remember I had a client uh, that once upon a time was uh, very self-destructive, uh, didn't feel that she deserved to live, and part of her homework was to create a journal and to do a good deed every day. Well, actually, it was one good deed the first week. We moved up to five good deeds by week five, uh, and she maintained that for 10 weeks during what's known as a brief therapy. Bottom line is this. As she did good deeds, she would record them in the journal. And then she would read that journal before she closed her eyes and went to bed at night. And she would reflect upon how it made her feel and upon how the other person felt. And as she was creating happiness or joy for other people, as she was assisting other people, she began to realize that she was becoming happy, that she was beginning to believe that she was worth something. And, you know, her self-mutilation, her self-destructive behavior in that regard completely ended by the end of 10 weeks. Um, Just today, you and I went to lunch, and we happened to have a great waitress that takes care of us at a restaurant we visit once a week. And we took her just a, a thank you note that simply said, hey, you know, we appreciate you spoiling us. You make us happy. Uh, we hope this, you know, uh, increases your level of happiness today. And then we gave her a small gift. Well, she lit up like, you know, uh, a candle in the middle of the darkest of nights. So it doesn't take an awful lot for us to increase our happiness by increasing the happiness of others. Absolutely. Appreciate everyone around you. All right, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Professor William Ferriolo, and we discussed his meditations on self-discipline and failure. And forgive me, I, I, you know, that little crack in my voice, that little smile is because Bill sent me a a, a private email that said he'd listened to the show and he sounded like some kind of a baboon. Uh, which is, of course, not at all true, but he, he's got a great sense of humor. If you listen to the show, you know what I'm talking about. And if you didn't get to the archives, it was a great show. Aretha wrote, your guest made a lot of sense. I'll have to get his book. Richard commented, evidence, rump. There are extrapolations based upon material observations. They might be 99.647% likely to be true against free will but they aren't 100%. Beth wrote, So there is a ton of evidence that shows non-material consciousness, and then there is a ton of evidence that shows that free will does not exist. Therefore, the truth lies somewhere in between. Well, maybe, Beth, but yeah, I don't think there is a ton of evidence on non-material consciousness. There is some, but by comparison, they're really not equivalent. 
Lester wrote, your guest has a good point. Where does the right, where is the right not to be offended? Where does that come from? If you want to stifle a conversation of free speech, just think of how quickly our ability to communicate is cut off by words. That offends me. Well, if you think about it, he's got a solid point there. Um, and as we discussed last week, sometimes uh, our PC um, attitudes go a bit too far. Moving on, Jamil wrote, Eldon, you've done some amazing interviews on your radio. Alexandria wrote, I love your books and radio show, Eldon. Thank you for doing what you do. Wendy wrote this regarding last week's spotlight. Hi, Eldon. Well, that spotlight was spot on. I'm sitting on my balcony in my new unit thinking about how much negative self-talk I've had to overcome in my life. That is what I have control of, not what life presents to me. I know a lot of that is choice, but who chooses conditioning or desires? I read an interesting piece that, in fact, there is no now, as we are always responding to what just happened. It really does just come down to, it's not what happens to us, but what we think about what happens to us. I totally agree with everything you have said. Finally, Vera from Russia wrote, I listened to your inner talk on finding employment, and it did help me find employment, even though I was very anxious during the process of job hunting. Nevertheless, the company that made me an offer did it in less than two weeks, including all the test assignments and Skype face-to-face interviews. Well, congratulations, Vera. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but we do love your comments, so please keep them coming. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do sincerely appreciate your thoughts and ideas. Now to today's show, Synesthesia with author Dr. Richard Seidowick. Before we get him in here, allow me to tell you a little about today's guest. Dr. Richard E. Seidowick is a clinical professor of neurology at George Washington University. He is best known for having rediscovered synesthesia, the involuntary coupling of the senses, and returning the phenomenon to mainstream science after decades of disbelief. He received the Montaigne Medal with David Eagleman for Wednesday is Indigo Blue, a book Oliver Sacks called A Unique and Indispensable Guide for Anyone Interested in How We Perceive the World. Dr. Seidowick, also holds a Master of Fine Arts and is a two-time Artist Fellow of the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. He writes the Fallible Mind column for Psychology Today. It's a great column and is currently finishing a book about screen interruptions titled Digital Distractions Versus Your Addicted Stone Age Brain. Looking forward to that one. We have discussed that before on this show. In fact, we've had a couple of experts at digital interruptions but that'll be a good one. All right. We'll talk about his latest book today, titled Simply Synesthesia. It's part of the Essential Knowledge series from MIT Press, which calls it, quote, an accessible short primer for a founder of the field. It's a great book, by the way. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Richard Seidewick. Thank you, Elden. Nice to be here. Ah, good. I'm glad, sir. I look forward to the show. I did enjoy your book. Uh, Thank you so much. It's a remarkable contribution, I think, especially since, you know, I'm old enough to remember when synesthesia was billed often as a hoax and a fraud, and, well, we'll get into all that later. But, Doctor, on this show, we like to know who is the messenger, what is the message, and, of course, how could we use it? So, to that end, please share with us your passions and and ambitions or goals? All at once. Okay. Well, my passions are, I like to write. Um, to me, it's like solving a puzzle, because I never know what I think until I read what I say. And uh, <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm working early in the morning before the sun comes up, you know, when the world is quiet, my mind is, my mind is quiet, it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm solving a mystery some way. And there's a great pleasure when things click and suddenly an idea becomes clear. And usually the the shorter something is, the harder it is to accomplish. Um, And that's part of the MIT Press's Essential Knowledge Series. They're 
They're written by experts in the field on a wide variety of topics, but they've got to be very, very short, and they're a pocket-sized book, and uh, it's hard to be concise. As Mark Twain said to someone, he said, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. (laughs) I have to ask you on that, Doctor. Uh, How much of your work is intuitive? You know, comes from some, you know... uh, you know, some sense of like aggregated information and inspiration, but but what we call intuitive. How much of it is that? Well, I I, I have I have a different I have a different definition of intuitive probably for most people. And for neurologists, we're like Sherlock Holmes. We notice the thing that didn't happen. You know, the dog that didn't bark. So it, you we're always looking for clues. And so I think part of intuition, but intuitive people notice a great deal. They notice the details and the tiny little things, the, the, the remarks that seem a little bit uh, off that other people simply gloss by. And if you stop and pick up those clues, then they will lead you to the truth of the matter. So in, that sense, I, in that sense, I think I'm very intuitive because um, I'm also highly distractible. So I notice things that other people don't. Um, and uh, I've learned to be able to work with that. That's very interesting. For years, I was a practicing criminalist, and if you would have asked me uh, why, what was the secret to your success, I would have probably given you that same answer. Mm-hmm. Um, Pay attention, right? Yeah, it's, it, it is the detail. It, it is those subtle little clues that most people just, you know, they ignore. Um, they're there, also but... To, yeah, and also to challenge what you're hearing and seeing. So, for, you know, on the... If I had my way when I'm listening to the news, you know, I'd stop people after you know, every third word and say, wait a minute, how do you know that's true? What makes you say so? That's an assumption. That's not a fact, etc." So people just sort of gloss on, you know, at high speed, blabbering all sorts of nonsense. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, you, have to, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, I think. I agree. I call that sound by thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you heard today's spotlight, Doctor. What say you? You must have worked with patients who've gone through various forms of identity issues. Is there a higher charge than simply finding happiness with whoever we are? Oh, uh, I think it's to be grateful for what you have. Um, you know, we, we spend so much time uh, complaining about what we don't have and how things aren't the way we want them to be, when in fact, when you actually sit back and take a breath, most of us are, are, are pretty well off. And uh, I like to distinguish um, uh, between happiness and contentment. Um, um, happiness, by definition, is having that which is considered good. So in terms of you know, having you know, food in our stomachs and a roof over our head and clothes to wear, most of us in America are, by definition, pretty happy. And yet content, being content is not being disturbed by the desire for anything more or different, satisfied so as not to repine. And when I first came across that, I was flabbergasted. I thought, oh, my God, can you, be, can you imagine not being disturbed by desire for anything different? And actually, I, I, I actually was happy enough to achieve that state at one point. And it's quite remarkable to uh, just say everything is okay the way it is. You know, that doesn't mean that we sit like a bump on a log and don't go forward and don't participate in life. But I think that one of the clues to happiness is to take a measure of what you got and then focus on what you have any what, what you have control over rather than the things you have no control over. You know, most Very... people, you, you, you listen to people, they're so concerned about what they put in their bodies, what they eat, oh, if I just eat this and if I just do this exercise and if I go to yoga blah, 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 then I'll live to be 100. Well, that's not true. We, what we have control over is this minuscule little zone of our lives. But everything else is a matter of happenstance and fate and circumstance. And so if you focus on what you really have control over, and this is what I tell my students and my medical students all the time, is, you know, focus on what you have, you know, the schedule that you can control and, and, and things like that, and then you won't worry so much about being at the bank and call everybody else. I love it. Very well said, Doctor. Okay. Let's talk about synesthesia. Let's As you heard in the spotlight, 
We interviewed Dr. Joel Salinas on this show. He's yes, a physician. I assume you know of him if you don't know him. I do. Yes, we were at an a, a, a art and science conference out in Los Angeles a few months ago. Well, are there many synesthetes who actually feel another person's pain, not empathize, but actually feel it? Well, there aren't too many that we know of. This is just this is the kind of synesthesia that has only recently become, I, I guess the word would be popularized. Um, mirror touch, we've known about it, but there haven't there just there haven't been enough people who are using it in their daily lives in a professional capacity the way Joel is as a physician. Or there's another nurse who's quite famous. She works in the intensive care nursery, and she's able to spot babies who are in distress before other nurses can. So. Um, I think there are, you know, synesthesia is one in uh, 23 people inherit the genes for this. One in 90 have some kind of overt synesthesia. Um, so there are some types that are more common than others, but the mirror touch with the empathy, feeling other people's pain, is probably one of the rarer kinds. I would say it's around 1 to 2% of all the different kinds. Yeah, I, I get the empathic part. I mean, you know, I could see a dog hit by a car and my stomach goes light and I maybe you know, I get this feeling like goosebumps or something, you know. And, yeah, and it's, well, goosebumps you know, is a kind of normal synesthesia. Yeah, but I can't imagine being a medical doctor and actually feeling my patient's pain. I mean, I think I'd get out of medicine in a hurry. Well, I think the problem there is, is that being able to compartmentalize so you don't become the other person keep yourself separate from, from the other. And I think doctors have to do that all, all the time. We have to keep our, just, you know, we, we care, we're, we're empathetic, we feel for our patients. But we also have to separate ourselves professionally from them as another person. And for someone like Joel, or this nurse I mentioned, then it's, uh, it, 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 it's all the more important that they do that for their own all right, I want to talk about personality influence uh, on synesthetes, but you're kind of a founder in this. If I read the information correctly, it was about 1984 when you really got involved. What, what on earth made you turn to synesthesia? It, it, was, it was the late 70s, actually. It was 1978 and 79. And okay. um, it was simply by accident. I happened to know the word because I like words. And I read a, a book about a, a, a memory expert who had a five-fold synesthesia, um, and he was Soviet. He made a stage career as a memory expert. And I thought, oh, what a cool word. Anesthesia, no sensation. Synesthesia, joined or coupled sensation. And I filed it away in the back of my mind. Then a new neighbor who taught at the School of the Arts, he taught lighting design, invited me to dinner to meet some friends. And he said, oh, it'll be a few minutes. There aren't enough points on the chicken. <laughs> well, his friends laughed and said, oh, Michael, what are you smoking this time? And, and Michael Watson turned to me and said, well, if you're a neurologist, maybe we understand. Uh, I, I, when I taste something, I also feel it on my face and in my hands. A feeling sweeps down my arm, and I feel weight, shape, temperature, and texture as if I'm actually grasping something. And I said, oh, I was just trying to be I said, oh, you have synesthesia. And he looked at me and he said, you mean there's a name for what I do? And I thought, how odd. How could he not know? And that was the first inkling that this was something unusual. Oh, interesting. Uh, and okay. I happened to, to be at a place in a time where I was able to study it. But, uh, you know, you mentioned that people thought this was bogus and a fraud. And, uh, when I told my, my uh, neurology colleague, they said, well, the first thing they said is, well, what does this cat pan show? And I said, no, no, you don't understand. There's not a hole in his head. He's got something extra the way people with perfect pitch have something extra. And they just rolled their eyes and said, oh, man, this is too weird, too new age. Stay away. It'll ruin your career. And I thought, why are they so hostile to this? You know? And that was my experience for the first 10, 15 years was the professors of neurology and meetings and you know, everybody would, they would turn up their nose and say, oh, this would possibly be a real brain thing. They're making it up. They just want attention. They're burned out, you know, drug addicts with residual hallucinations. Uh, or they're just artists and everybody knows that artists are crazy. So, you know, we'll just ignore all this. 
but I couldn't ignore it. <laughs> that speaks about your personality some. <laughs> I uh, think we've, so. got, we've got a, uh, a hard break coming up. But when we come back, I want to, I mean, this had to have a negative influence initially back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, synesthesia was thought to just be a, a hoax. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about how your peers responded to your work. We're speaking sure. with Dr. Richard Sidowick about his work and book, Synesthesia. Great book. Get the book. You can get it online. Synesthesia, Richard E. Sidowick. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at cytowick.net. That's C-Y-T-O-W-I-C dot net. Now we have a video for you in our chat room featuring our guest on the subject of what color is Tuesday. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get on over there, and you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Okay, do please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used inner talk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to intertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Dr. Richard Sidowick about his work and book, Synesthesia. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Sidowick.net. That's C-Y-T-O-W-I-C dot net. Now we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. And as you know, I'm working on a book on this area right this minute, and I I love this opportunity to get answers from some of our guests about what makes their music so important. We just played some of Snowfall, performed by Christopher Joel Carter on the piano. So please tell us, Doctor, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, it's uh, it's an old standard from the uh, from the uh, American songbook written by Claude Thornhill, and I studied after I did the usual piano lessons starting at six. When I started in high school, I studied with a progressive jazz teacher and I learned to play uh, jazz piano, uh, sort of the cocktail lounge. And so this Snowfall, in particular, Christopher Joe Carter's um, rendition of it, just it puts me in a wonderful, relaxed. Uh, open-minded mood. I, I like the rhythm of it, the harmonies of it. Um, you know, music. I, now, of course, I like classical music as well. Um, so, all kinds of music. I think it's really uh, soothes my mind. All right. So, <clears throat> jazz. Lots of folks have been accused of, uh, you know, having some interesting beliefs when it comes to jazz as their favorite. I happen to find jazz to be my favorite as well, but what do you think of uh, music psychology in general? Oh, I think it's an interesting field. It's sort of like art um, art psychology or art therapy. There's so much there's so much more said than you can say in words. Okay, so I, I have think to ask... Is, I think, yes, go ahead. 
Go, no, you go ahead, Doc. No, so I think, um, yes, it, there's, more, there's more to it. There's, there's a lot of meaning to it, and, of course, the meaning is nonverbal. And, uh, and as far as the communicative medium, um, you know, our emotional limbic brain is uh, highly resonant when we're listening to music. Uh, we get goosebumps, we tear up, we're, we're, we're energized, whatever the music may be doing to us at any, morning, at any moment. So it's communicating to us, it's speaking to us in a nonverbal way. Of, yeah, of, of very speaking. often in an emotional way. Um, but then we see also that lyrics can be important to people. They fall in love with the lyrics if they fit with the right, you know, music itself. But the reason I asked you that follow-up, and I've uh, and I've got another one here, is because crosstalk, if I understand your work, uh, is is an important part of perhaps how or the explanatory value that you're currently working with as a hypothesis for um, synesthesia. Uh, explain to us what you mean by crosstalk and how music fits into that as a model. Well, um, yes, crosstalk, or that is connection between different senses and different aspects of, of the way we think, is the standard feature of all brains. It's just that synesthetes have more of it, and they're consciously aware that they, they, they have this. And that's why um, we haven't talked about the most common kind of synesthesia, which is color graphene, that is the written element of language, letters, numerals, punctuation marks, these take on uh, color that once established in childhood stay the same throughout a person's life. Um, so that's a kind of crosstalk between the color area, of V4, what's called V4 of the human brain, and the uh, area that lets us recognize these the visual configurations that we call letters and numerals. Uh, so okay. as Yes, go ahead. No, I, again, I don't mean to interrupt you. Please. So, um, you know, sight and sound, for example, are, are already are already tightly, so tightly combined in all of us that that's why even bad ventriloquists can convince us that the dummy is doing the talking. Cinema is another example where we think the dialogue, we're, we're convinced, we're persuaded that the dialogue comes from the mouth on the screen rather than the speakers that are surrounding us. And then in terms of music, well, dance is another example of a normal synesthesia in which the body imitates the sound and the tempo rhythm of the music, both visually and kinetically. So those are sort of normal synesthesias. And then we have the ones that seem odd to people who've never heard of them before, such as colored hearing or colored, uh, you know, seeing letters in, in colors, even though they're printed, printed in black ink. Now, I have to ask you this because actually you I know the answer of it read your book but uh I think one it, one of the things that I was unaware of and I'm going to digress people hear music and their bodies move period mm -hmm. yeah, but they don't necessarily move in the same way but Synesthetes who see numbers as a case in point in in color, they see it all as the same color. Is that always the case with synesthetes? I mean, is there a fixed uh, color across the board perceived by a synesthete for say the number two or the number nine? Oh no! Or... Every every, indivi every individual sees the number. Let some people see the number two is differently colored from somebody else. So there's not a there's not a universal translation going on here um, between, let's say, letters and numbers and colors and all this. So for a given individual, um, each, each letter has a different color. They, 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 that stays the same throughout their lifetime. Somebody else, even a sibling or an identical twin who has colored letters with graphene synesthesia, uh, they will have different colors that they see. So there really is very little difference then when you talk about the crosstalk and music causing motion. No, on the no on the surface. So on the surface, it looks like there's no nothing in common. But where the similarity is happening is under the hood, where right. where we're not consciously aware of what's going on. Okay, you talked about siblings. So are you saying that this runs in the family? There's some kind of genetic component. Yes, it runs strongly in families. Uh, Sir Francis Bolton noticed, uh, noted this well over 100 years ago. Um, and it can go from either parent, he, 
to either sex or child, and it's usually seen in multiple generations because it's inherited as an autosomal dominant trait, the way that brown and green eyes are. Blue eyes are a recessive trait, which is why they're so much uh, rarer than, than other colored eyes. So, yes, it, it, it runs strongly in families, and it has to do with our genes, just the way that our, the color of our hair and how tall we are also has to do with our genes. Having said yeah. that, you know, you, in order to have synesthesia, you need two things. You have to ha- inherit the genetic tendency to uh, hyper-connect or connect them a greater than usual amount, different aspects of sensation. But then as a child, you've also got to be exposed to cultural artifacts like letters and, and alphabets in the days of the week and the names of the foods that you eat and the names of musical notes and stuff like that. And then that's when this, this connection takes root and stays fast for the rest of your life. Now, and, 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 you know, every time I ask you a question, I get 10, and you give me an answer, I have 10 more questions. <laughs> but this is cross-cultural uh, as well, I take it. Yes, it's, it's seen around the world, and you know, what are different things, all, all countries, whatever languages are spoken. And, of course, it, and languages that don't use the Roman alphabet also have, have uh, geography in the Zika. So if you write in Chinese as the real characters, they will also be. Now, somebody who's bilingual, for example, let's say an American who speaks Russian, the colors for the Russian A will not necessarily be the same color as the Amer- as the American A. Mm. It's endlessly fascinating. Yeah, and I, then I, I, if you're bilingual, um, let's say it's uh, it's a language like Arabic, mm-hmm. and and English. Or Chinese, that would be better. Chinese and English, yes. where you have complete, you know, completely different structure, written and spoken. Exactly. Uh, are the colors the same in when I when I'm speaking English or I'm using the English language? Do I see well, the same color that Chinese, I do with the Chinese character? I think it depends on it depends on which language you grow up speaking first. So if you're a Chinese dynasty, your Chinese characters are going to stay the same colors for you, you know, all, all your life. And you, when you start speaking uh, American or any other language, that English, whatever, any other language that uses the Roman alphabet, um, they may or may not be colored. So usually it's the first language that you pick up. Um, and the more complicated the language, that is, the, the harder a given language is to learn, the more rules and exceptions and things that it has, the more likely it's to be, it is that it's going to be a highly synesthetic language. And that's why English has got so many synesthetes, because our language is just crazy with all the exceptions that we have. Mm, wow. Well, all right. So, I the, know we've... so, the, so the, the linguistic difficulty also figures in. We've wandered away from the break and the question I promised I was going to ask you, but right, I'll come back to that now. What there was? must have been a negative influence on your career. I mean, 40 years ago, um, I think for all intent and purposes, this idea you could say was, well, I think your words, too new agey, uh, and it might ruin your career. What, what was that belief about and how did it impact your career? Well, I think that was just sort of the, you know, the, the, the tempo of the times. Is that's, what, that's what the establishment thought. And back then, the establishment was pretty rigid the way establishments tend to be. And so, you know, their, their habit is to explain away what they don't wish to understand or with what they can't understand. Uh, but as far as me, I mean, I, happened, I was blessed at being in a position where I didn't have to care about whether I was going to get grants or, or, or have academic advancement, etc. I was already an independent scientist early on. So it, to me, I simply, it didn't matter. Uh, now, as a contrast to that, I would get letters and telephone calls from, let's say, Ph.D. students who are you know, working on, starting out on their doctorate, and they would say, oh, I would love to do this for my thesis, but I don't dare my chairman would kick me out. I can't, because again, this is, this is not, not the kind of thing that, that respectable scientists do. And that attitude carried on, oh, and probably until my, my 
my second book, which is a popular book, came out, and that was in 94, uh, The Man Who Tasted Sheep. And then that's about the guy that tasted that, uh, who didn't have enough points on the chicken when he tasted it. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy to say, no, it hasn't affected my career at all. Um, and now I end up being the, you know, the, the old guru who gets invited all around the world to talk about this stuff. So it's rather fun. And not just talk. I mean, I do it, it, I, interesting things with the art, too. I would just um, was in Toronto before, and I gave the pre-concert talk before uh, a program of 24 Scriabin preludes, and they, which were, were being performed with the light show, because Scriabin was a synesthetic musician uh, who wrote colored music. So that was a lot of fun. It sounds like, and it must also be a bit amusing to you now to realize, you know, in 2020 hindsight, uh, the vacuum that allowed you to just, you know, do everything that you've done, make a huge contribution you've made because other people were afraid of stepping into a domain that we think of as science, the, the yet undiscovered, the yet unidentified. Well, you know, and the, what, what the very gratifying is, you know, this caused what's called a paradigm shift in the way we think about how the brain is organized. So that's rather a kick in the head to have brought that about. But then the other is that, you know, there are young people all around the world who are now studying this with a great deal of passion. So there are a lot of, lot of books, a lot of papers being written about this. So um, nobody's afraid anymore. And that's been the case for about the past 15 years or so. Um, people are free to study it. They get grants for it. Uh, nobody blinks an eye anymore. It's quite well accepted. And the third thing that's very gratifying is the people. You know, so often people have been, they've been ridiculed, disbelieved, and they say, oh, you're the, you've saved my life. You're the first one who ever believed me. You know, or I thought I was the only person in the world with this. And now I realize there's, you know, there's all other people that I can talk to. There's an online, you know, community where people send us these different kinds, you know, can chat with one another. And even though they have different kinds of synesthesia, they know exactly what the other person's talking about. Yeah, I would think that would be the most gratifying part about it is that they're able to be who they are without shame or ridicule. Yeah, you're talking about identity, yeah. Yeah. All right, let me ask you this. I I think about, and you heard the spotlight, I think about these kinds of uh, events, and I, and I think, you know, do these people... Uh, do you ever do they get overwhelmed at seeing and feeling or tasting all these extra sensations? I mean, don't they find it confusing? Well, no, because it's what I call their texture of reality. It would be like you saying to a blind a blind person saying to you, "Gee, Eldon, everywhere you look, you're always seeing something. Doesn't it drive you crazy always having to see something wherever you look?" And of course, the answer is no, because seeing is our texture of normal reality. Synesthetes just have a different texture of reality. So they sort of wonder, you know, how can we remember things if we can't, you know, if, if names and addresses and facts don't have colors and tastes and scents attached to them. So they sort of pity us that our, our senses seem so, so puny by comparison. Let me, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Take what you just said, and let's say that I want to develop a, a, a synesthetic ability. Is that possible? Is that something that our listeners could cultivate, maybe even experience on a temporary basis? And if so, how? Well, there are acquired synesthesia, uh, and there, you can get them with drug ingestion, famously LSD and other kinds of hallucinogens in the serotonergic class. But that, that only occurs in about 9% of drug ingestions, and I certainly don't recommend it. And the, the experience itself, the quality of the experience, is really not like the normally, naturally occurring synesthesia. The other would be meditation, is that during deep states of absorption and meditation, again, when the brain is quiet, the chatter of the, the neocortex is, is, is quieted down. Um, you may have synesthetic experiences where a sudden taste or a sound or a, 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 a vision, uh, not, a, not a vision, let's say, a, a shaped color with movement will arise and all that 
that happens to me uh, when I meditate. And then the third kind would be head trauma. People who have closed head trauma, they fall down the stairs or they're in auto accident, something like that. They may have a temporary synesthesia that lasts for about, um, you know, three months or so, and then it goes away. So um, you can't really cultivate it. You can't learn to do it. Uh, but, you know, we talked about paying attention before. I think, you know, what, what synesthesia teaches us, and, and this is, what really thrills me when young, when school, school-age kids, you know, do science projects and book reports about it, is that you realize that other people have a different point of view than you do. And so, synesthesia, a small change in, the, in a number of nucleotides in their DNA makes them see the world in a completely different way. And yet, it's the same way, that you and I, same world that you and I are looking at. And so I think synesthesia uh, sensitizes us, makes us more sensitive to other, other people's points of view, something we could use in this time of, you know, political fraughtness where we're oh, amen. growth all the time. Amen, amen to that one. I, uh, you know, when we think about metaphors, you hear things like that's a loud color or that's sharp cheese or that's a sweet person. Does that got anything to any, any connection whatsoever with synesthesia? Yes, it does. And of course, you know, take it take the sharp cheese meta- metaphor. Um, now that's really odd because cheese isn't sharp, rather soft. And why do we use a taste adjective like sweet to describe it to, to describe a person? Well, it turns out that behind the scenes, under the hood, if you want to say. There are lawful and regular correspondences among the different senses, that is, they follow rules, so that both synesthetes and non synesthetes for example, will say that a higher tone is both brighter and smaller than a low tone. Even mm. the taste maps the high, low, and bright dark dimensions, so that we say that a darkly tinted liquid tastes and smells stronger than its equivalent pale version. So these are examples of normal synesthesia that are sort of operating on an implicit basis in all of us. So let me see that I've got this correct. Um, you know, we, we're not telling anybody to drop acid. If you want to experience it, meditate and or then think about how well or how easy it is for you to identify with some of these metaphors like why would I recognize that a color is loud? But the minute I think of that, I see loud colors in my mind. Uh, and in, in some sense, then, I guess we're all a bit synesthetic. Is that yes, true? Yes, we are. You know, even a four-year-old can understand a synesthetic metaphor like warm and cool colors. So there, there is, you know, so synesthetes are doing what all of us are doing, except we're not consciously aware of these cross-sensory couplings that are happening all the time in our brain. Uh, if we were, we probably wouldn't be able to get anything done. We, we would be overwhelmed by it. And so these people just happen to, this, some of this, the, the mechanism under the hood, if you will, is made conscious to the people that we call citizens. And they're aware of these cross-couplings, and they're able to take advantage of it in the city because it gives them extraordinarily good memory. All right, we're short of time, so I'm going to ask you to give me like a 30-second soundbite here, but I've read that right hemispheric dominated folks, typically the, the composer, the artist, the, you know, the musician and so forth, um, they're more inclined to be synesthetic is it, or to be synesthetes. Is, is that true or false? Synesthesia is more common among artists. And uh, there are some famous ones like novelist Vladimir Nabokov, painter David Hockney, uh, Billy Joel, Lady Gaga, etc. And uh, but even for people who aren't famous, synesthetes, synesthetes tend to be creative. They tend to speak a foreign language, play a musical instrument, or do some other kind of activity. And then I have to correct you about right brain. The whole right brain, left brain thing is full, well, let's say, nonsense. It's where it's just too highly oversimplified. Well, I don't disagree with that, but we've given Nobel Prize to men like Sperry for his work. And so I meant right hemisphere in its generalization, doctor. Uh, In about 
20 seconds. Where's the best place our audience can get your book? Uh, you can go to Amazon or you can go to uh, MITpress.com. Uh, there, that, that's the best way to get it. And there's uh, the current one is, is, a, is a small, t- a short book called Synesthesia. And there's also The Man Who Tasted Shape about the Michael Watson who complained about there not being enough points on the chicken. And all that's under Amazon. Okay, once again, the book, Synesthesia by Richard E. Sidowick, M.D. MIT Press Defense Essential Knowledge Series. It is a great read. If you've enjoyed today's show, I know for sure you're going to want this book because there's a lot we just didn't get a chance to discuss. I want to thank you, Dr. Sidowick, uh, for your willingness to share your work with us. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends, let's have them join us as well. Until next time, then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other...